there's many things that I hope that you learn when you come into this space and that you know when you come into this space and that you feel um, in your bones. But I think more than anything, what I hope that you come away with when you're in this space is knowing that you're loved. That there is a God that loves you regardless of your situation, your circumstances, your predicaments, that knows the deepest pain and shame in your life and speaks over it and says, I love you. You are loved. These candles this morning remind us of how deep that love can be. We come up to, uh, to, this, um, to this stage and we light a candle um, and we remember that person, and what we remember about them is not um, a resume. It's not what they accomplished in their life. Um, it's not all the great things that they did. What we remember is who they are. The love that they give, the light that they give, the hope or the grace that they give. So I hope as you lit a candle this morning, you remembered that you are loved. My name's Julie. Good morning. <laughs> it's been heavy so far. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in there with us, and I, I hope that you uh, feel the presence of God here. Um, and I'm thrilled to be part of this Access community um, and to get to worship with you every Sunday. There was a boy um, who was six years old and was in a horrible fire. Now, I didn't happen to think about talking about fire today while we were lighting all these candles, and so I'm glad that this has managed okay this morning. But um, this boy was in a horrible fire when he was um, six years old, and he was saved from it. And his mom firmly believed when he was saved from that fire that, um, that he was saved for a purpose, a really deep and important purpose, um, for something that God was going to do in his life. And so he always kept that in the back of his mind um, as he went through school. And he began to pursue um, ministry. And he became a pastor. And he went to a really important school and joined a lot of different um, uh, groups and studies and really dove into the scriptures and became a devoted follower of God. But he always had in the back of his mind that he just wasn't doing enough. It just wasn't enough. No matter what he did, was God really there? Did God really love him? What would he have to do to prove to God that he was enough? He went over, uh, this was, um, uh, he lived over in London area, came over to the United States, and uh, became a missionary over here. And for two years, it failed miserably. He couldn't quite get his feet under him. He didn't quite know what he was doing. And whatever he was hoping to accomplish in that time just didn't work. And so he went back to London and he was sitting with this small group and he was talking about this feeling of failure that he had on his life. And one of the people in his small group um, began to talk to him about this notion. He said, you know, John, maybe... Maybe our faith and our salvation is not about doing enough. Doing is important, of course, and, and all that we learn and we do is, is for the work of God, and that's great, but maybe it's not to prove something. Maybe God's grace can show us something. Maybe God's grace is what we need to be focused on here instead of trying to prove something to God. Maybe God has already proven something to us. So John Wesley began to preach this message of grace. His critics would go on to call him an unruly agitator. I want you to see this picture of him. He wasn't allowed to preach in the churches because this notion of grace was just a little bit too overwhelming and just a little bit too scandalous for the churches in England. Because what the churches in England believed at this time was that grace was given to a select group of people, the elite. You would normally know these people because it was based basically on your economic class. If you were somebody who was not sick, 
If you were somebody who was not poor, then that probably meant that you were God's chosen people. But if you were sick, if you were poor, if you maybe didn't have all of the wealth that this world could give you, then maybe God just didn't pick you. And John Wesley just didn't really like that a whole lot. And so he sat outside the churches and preached a different message. He began to preach a message to people. I want you to see who's in this picture. Children. Women. (gasps) People from different socioeconomic classes. All sitting outside. Listening to a message. And it was a message that John Wesley gave in a sermon where he said, Grace is free for all and in all. Now let's back up just for a minute and talk about what this word grace means. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. Great, cool Julie, churchy words. Let's try again. Grace means that there is no place that you can go where God's forgiveness and God's love is not there to meet you. We're going to talk a little bit more about different kinds of grace next week, but one of the ways that we are aware of that is that even before we know God is at work in our lives, even before we are aware we are in need of forgiveness, God's grace is at work. God is constantly seeking after us. God in and of God's self is grace, the constant pursuer. You know, oftentimes we talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we see this paradox of of who God is. Is God this judgmental and harsh and angry God, or is God more like the God of the New Testament? And I have a tendency to believe that while the Old Testament teaches us so much and is enriching to our faith and the stories of the people in Scripture there, what we see in the life and the teachings of Jesus is a little bit different. What we see in the life and teachings of Jesus is Jesus talking about God being the good shepherd, going after the lost sheep, talking about the prodigal son, that no matter how far you went and what you did, come back home. You don't have to stay. God meeting a woman at a well or on the floor as she is being accused of adultery and saying, you who have no sin, throw the first rock. And then looking at that woman and saying, get up, go. Not only is grace enough, but you do not have to stay in this place. I wonder if grace then talks instead of about a guilt-laden faith, instead of a grace-laden faith. It's the way Adam Hamilton puts it, a grace-laden faith, a faith that is covered in grace. So John Wesley is standing on the steps of this church, and he's preaching, and I want you to hear what he says. He says, how freely does God love the world? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were dead in our sin, God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. And how freely with him does he give us all things? The grace or love of God whence cometh our salvation is free in all and free for all. Then he breaks down what that means, free in all and free for all. He says, first, it is free in all to whom it is given. It does not depend on any power or merit in man. No, not in any degree, neither in whole nor in part. It does not in any wise depend either on the good works or righteousness of the receiver. Not on anything he has done or anything he is. It does not depend on his endeavors. It does not depend on his good tempers or his good desires or good purposes and intentions. For all these flow from the free grace of God. They are the streams only, not the fountain. They are the fruits of free grace, but not the root. They are not the cause, but the effects of it. Whatsoever good is in man or done by man, God is the author and doer of it. Thus is his grace free in all. That is no way depending on any power or merit in man, but on God alone, who freely gave us his son and with whom freely giveth us all things. So he's a little bit repetitive in there, right? But you get the point. There is not anything we could do There is not anything that we could accomplish 
while those things are good, they are the fruit, they are not the root. They are the stream, but they are not the fountain. Our grace, the grace that we find, the grace we receive, is not anything that we could do to deserve it. It's given to us free in all and free for all. But we have to backtrack a little bit for it more. Because I can get that if it's just for me. But when you begin to start talking to me about that being for everybody, and I mean everybody, the people I don't like, the people I struggle with, the people that make me mad, I don't think I'm the only one here. <laughs> the people I have a really hard time with, the people I struggle to say, that person, God, you give your grace to that person? So the early church had this same struggle too. So when they were going on and trying to decide after the time of Jesus, who really gets to be part of this club? Who gets to really be considered a Christian? Who gets to go to heaven and be part of the kingdom of God? And they had a lot of debate over it. We read in Acts chapter 15 um, a little bit of a story about that. In Acts, it's um, the same author that wrote the Gospel of Luke, so it's considered Luke part two. So catching you up a little bit, Luke's Gospel ends with the resurrection of Jesus, and then Acts picks up with the apostles. The apostles going out, the disciples going out and starting churches and beginning to talk about Jesus in all different regions around and then we get the persecution of those disciples, and then ultimately the death of those disciples. But then we see what we call Pentecost. And as that good news begins to spread about the, the life and the resurrection of Jesus, people who don't have hardly anything in common begin to speak in the same language. Yet that's still not enough for the people in the early church to really make sure that this really is for everybody. So they're having a debate about it, and we find it in chapter 15, starting in verse 6. It says, the apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter, the matter of who gets to come into the kingdom of God. After they had, there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that I should be one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testifies to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by the faith, has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. We see that word yoke in there. What Peter says to them is, why are you putting God to the test? Why are you putting on the disciples a yoke that they are not seem to fit and we are not able to fit? That word yoke is a, um, is a plowing tool that was used back then. So if your ox or your horse died, you not only were out an animal, you were also out the, um, the yoke because it was fitted just for that animal. So any time your horse died, you had to not only get a new animal, you also had to get a new yoke because it was fitted just for that particular purpose. And so what Peter says to this first church is, why are you putting something in a box that does not need to be in a box? It doesn't fit us. It doesn't fit us to exclude people. It doesn't fit us to say that this is for a certain group of people but not others. That grace is not only a comfort to us today, friends, it is a challenge. Because it's for us and it's for others as well. Jesus was asked in the New Testament by a group of um, religious leaders who, um, what is the greatest commandment? Among all of the commandments, all the rules in the Old Testament, which they were referring to, they're putting Jesus to the test. Which one's the greatest? And Jesus looks at them and says, I don't like the terms of your question. And he tells them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. 
that's not something that can easily not only be done, but that's not a rule that can just be followed. The rules are great, but without God's grace, none of it is possible. God's grace gives us the capacity to follow God, to follow the commandments. But first we see grace. And that grace tells us about a love that is unending, a love that we not only receive, but a love that we are called to give. This is a huge part of our identity here in Access. I'm going to invite the band to come back up on stage. And as they're coming up, I want to read to you where the name of Access came from. It came from a scripture in Romans 5 where... um, where Paul, who's the writer of Romans, is talking to this church in Rome about grace and about how we receive grace. It says, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access. See it there? That's where it comes from. Access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. This community is part of a group of other communities called United Methodists. This is us. We are part of a chain I was at a wedding this past weekend and um, had a bunch, 12 under 12, yeah, cousins sitting in a row with me, and I was trying to figure out how to keep them preoccupied during the ceremony. And so I had a few pieces of paper, and so we were making a chain link. And so that same understanding of grace that started with Jesus was found by John Wesley, who called for reformation and revival in the church. Not just to be about religion, but about a movement of God's spirit among us, of God's grace that is within us, and it is for all, and it is in all. So I'm part of this access community because I'm part of that chain link. That chain link that believes in God's grace that says everyone is welcome here because we all have access to God's grace. I call this community my home because while vulnerability is hard, it is worth it. Because you get to embrace me and love me for who I am, and I get to do the same for you. And I believe that is the kind of community that God has called us to. Grace that is for all and in all. Hope does not disappoint, friends.